Can you imagine right now picking up and going to a foreign land with nothing? Yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, it's not easy. To, it's not easy going from uh, a very kind of middle upper class engineer to coming here, and your degrees are not, you know, valid. So you basically had to start from the bottom and. Uh, was a mechanic and then, you know, built a mechanic shop and everything from there. But he was somebody that, like, when it came to his grandkids and, you know, his grandchild, like, did not um, waver. Like, we, you know, he would just be like the nurturer. My grandma was a little bit more strict, but he would take me to Home Depot every weekend and I would always look forward to that. And then he would, like, build stuff and work on projects and, um, you know, that's like one like repeated memory I have with him. That was kind of our thing. What if you had a dream or desire to write your first book? You could finally share your story or express your views about a topic or subject you are passionate about. And what if 2020 became the year your dream became a reality? Turn a new chapter in your life, literally. Join me for a live webinar where I'll share my 10-step program for writing a best-selling book. Register now. Seats are limited. Don't miss it. I believe in you. Your best selling book is waiting to be written. Don't let another week. slip by. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks. My guest today is Shanae Murray, healthcare hey. marketing phenom, content creator, cancer survivor, speaker, and goodwill ambassador of public health. Shanae, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for the invite, Roger. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you today. And, and I, I talk to a lot of people about this because it's crazy in the social media world that we live in. We, we see people through social media, through their posts over time. I've been following you probably for at least a year and mm -hmm. just very inspired by, by your content and what you post because it's, it's very real. And, and a couple of things this week that touched me from, from what you did was you, you talked about your grandparents. Mm -hmm. You talked about your grandma cleaning mansions. You talked about your grandpa being an engineer. And mm -hmm. posts like that really hit home for me, and I'm sure for many others as I see the interaction. Is, how do you feel about that? Is that something that, um, that you've been doing for a while, pulling in pieces of your roots to mm -hmm. help people see um, you know, maybe a, a, a different side of you? Yes. Um, and, you know, I have grown, like, as my network has grown, my connection with them has also grown. So, um, although some posts, sometimes I repeat, I like to, like, you know, just reveal a little bit more about myself, where I come from, um, where a lot of these traits that people ask me about come from. And, um, you know, my grandparents were imperative in that. And, also, I always try to bring it back to business. So like the post about my grandpa, my grandpa was an engineer. Um, and then, you know, it was a time where Castro took over Cuba. 
and he wanted out. So his professional network, like one, one person led to another person. And then he was a finally able to like, you know, basically get access to freedom for not just himself, but for his family. So the power of that one connection basically allowed him to bring his family to America and then change the course of, you know, our family uh, future forever. Had he not had that connection, he would have had to stay in Cuba and, you know, you never know um, what would have happened from there. So that's the power of, of network. And with that post in, in particular, I was trying to bring that home. I've heard similar stories of other Cuban families who have done very similar things as your grandfather and, mm -hmm. you know, basically give up everything, everything, mm -hmm. have to turn in everything and, and come here with nothing. And for yeah. us to, you know, if you really wrap your mind around that, can you imagine right now picking up and going to a foreign land with nothing? I know. It's scary. It's scary. So I give, I give him and so many others so much credit, you know, for, for centuries. That's how this country was built, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's those lessons, I think, that has helped people like you and I become who we are because of our grandparents and our parents, you know, the, the, the way they brought us up with the values, with that. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, it's not easy. To, it's not easy going from uh, a very kind of middle upper class engineer to coming here and your degrees are not, you know, valid. So he basically had to start from the bottom and uh, was a mechanic and then, you know, built a mechanic shop and everything from there. So that's like a whole other part of the story that I haven't even touched on yet. But I mean, I couldn't even imagine it's very difficult to do. Right. Would you mind sharing a story with us about your grandfather, one that might be memorable, either recent or, you know, when you were... Um, I mean, my grandpa was just, uh, he was like a, a sociable person, I guess. Sometimes, like, you had to be bit, like close to him for him to open up. But he was somebody that, like, when it came to his grandkids and, you know, his grandchild, like, did not um, waver. Like, we, you know, he would just be, like, the nurturer. My grandma was a little bit more strict. And uh, he would take me – I don't know why this comes up, but he would take me to Home Depot every weekend, and I would always look forward to that. And then he would, like, build stuff and work on projects. And, um, you know, that's, like, one, like, repeated memory I have with him. That was kind of our thing going to Home Depot, me helping him with projects and stuff like that, just that's for fun. fun. Yeah, that's fun. No, my grandfather, he would pick me up every Saturday morning. We'd go to the diner and yeah. we would drive around. He was a welder, so he would take me to the different spots of places that he worked on. And he was so proud. And But it's those moments that we remember, right, as, mm -hmm. as kids that have shaped us. So thank you for sharing that. I, I, You're I, welcome. So let's talk about, holy cow, your network on LinkedIn is just amazing. And, and I'm so proud, you know, that, that you've been able to do this. And, and I think it's because of your transparency and um, your vulnerability to a, a, a certain you know, extent, what I, which I'd like to talk about. Absolutely. But, but can you take us back to before, before LinkedIn was, you know, something uh, of, of, significance for you mm -hmm. life like then and then if you could kind of bring us up to date to how this all transpired okay so maybe like july of 2018 um i still was not involved in linkedin it was like more like november of 2018 so then i was just you know i was freelance writing so i had i had left my previous employer and i I did some like, you know, some creation for them. So I was like, let me just replace my full-time income then uh, with healthcare copywriting. So I had, you know, I was onboarding some clients and it was good, but it was so tiny compared to now looking back, but it was great practice. So I basically got into a very um, disciplined routine with my work and just delivering those very tiny projects looking back now. But it was going through the motions and learning the importance of like delivering things on time, um, delivering what people expect, communicating with your clients, no matter how tiny they are. Uh, and just like building that discipline, working through the night if you had to, because I, I, 
I mean, back then she was like maybe like a year, um, a year old, uh, have a daughter. So I had to learn, put her down, maybe work till 2 a.m., learn the sacrifice of that. So then um, I heard about LinkedIn and somebody like told me, oh, you, you know, maybe you could find more clients on LinkedIn. So I joined and I didn't really do much with it until like November. I was just kind of like reading. And then I was like, I saw um, Sam Lister's video actually. And it was like, oh, just do your first video. And I was like, okay, like this kid seems kind of cool. So uh, I, I did. And I thought that the for initial response was just because people on LinkedIn were supportive, you know, of that's usually how they are. So I was like, oh, you know, the first and the second video did well, but I thought it was like a fluke. And then I did like, you know, two more videos and I was pretty consistent. So I think like in the first month I was posting one a day wow. and I was like, they, they were doing well compared to like other people who had just started posting. So I was like, why? The quality was bad. I wasn't really like in a professional environment. And uh, I was like, what's different? So I started asking people because I'm that type of person. I like to get people's feedback. And they're like, oh, well, it's what you're saying. And also, like, it's just you're real. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't prepping for the camera like a lot of people on LinkedIn were at that time, like, in ter especially like the women in terms of makeup and everything. I was just kind of doing it. Um, what I had to say on the fly and then just publishing it and I guess what I was saying you know paired with the authenticity of it really rang home for a lot of people so that's how uh, I started that and then very shortly after I started to get inundated with like inbound interest in the little healthcare copywriting that I was doing so I was like okay this generates business and I continued it and then I met Courtney uh, in December. So this happened like, I could not even imagine how much my life was going to change at that time. It just happened like a domino effect, I would say. Then I met Courtney who reached out to me on LinkedIn and we had our first conversation. And then that's when uh, she started to refer business to me because it was just natural. She needed marketing for her clients and she didn't know where to seek it. And after about a month of that, I was like, well, why don't we just create a one-stop shop? Because uh, physicians want nothing more than convenience and they need both of these services. So we created our company and, you know, I, I was building along the way. So we kept getting inbound leads and um, it's, so to, com to answer your question from then, I, we were working, I was writing blogs for like, let's say health coaches or, you know, um, alternative uh, physicians or even, you know, private practice physicians to now we're doing full blown uh, marketing campaigns and healthcare management for long-term care facilities and large hospitals throughout the U S and that's just through LinkedIn. It's just an amazing story. But what I love about it is that, look, it's only what been a year and a half. Yeah if that. So yeah. there's so many lessons in that. The, the first one that comes to mind is you did it, right? You, you jumped in. You weren't, you were yeah. vulnerable, but you did it. And then it sounds like you, maybe the energy of what was happening, maybe you fed off of that and you were- Oh, a hundred percent. I'm the type of person that if, momentum is kind of like magic. If you know how to, how to lean into it and take advantage of it. And it's like, it's like surfing, right? Like in Florida, we have waves and stuff. So if you don't catch the right waves, like you're missing out on a lot of opportunity. And at the time I was just so focused. I mean, I am now, but I had changed my life so much in that little bit of time that the time between July and November really um, prepared me for the focus and discipline that I, I would need throughout the rest of the year. So it's kind of like crazy how things worked out, but yeah, and that's important, right? That hard work. You talked about that earlier, the, the, the mm -hmm. birth of your daughter, um, you know, staying up late, making the sacrifices. Oh, 100%. Right, the discipline. And a lot of people, especially the, the younger generation, they, they see the glitz and the glamour and they want that. And 
But whether it's yourself or a celebrity or an actor, whatever it is, there's always that piece of hard work that people don't see. Right. And, um, it's nice to just hear that backstory because, you know, you look at your profile and it's like, wow, you know. Yeah, woman that's not where I started at all. Yeah, you know? right, right, right. And that's why I love having these conversations because, number one, we are American real because we'd love to right. tell these real stories. But uh, real people like yourself who, who can walk us through that timeline and it gives others, including myself, hope that be, stay consistent. Put yourself Oh, 100%. Out there. People ask me, oh, like, you know, how did you do it? They always ask me, how did I do it? And it's like when I first started, there were like major players on LinkedIn. Like, you know, at the time I was just like a very small fish and I've surpassed you know, 95% of those people in terms of like network growth and engagement and stuff, just by staying consistent. A lot of those people, um, you know, they fall off for a month and they get back, they go on vacation and they try to get back on the horse. And uh, For me, it was just consistency and learning. So one thing that I do tell people that I see a lot of is people don't track their numbers. So for me, numbers don't lie, you know, if I put out a post and it doesn't do well, I don't tell myself, well, that was a really valuable post anyway. Like the audience didn't find it valuable to them. You know what I mean? For whatever reason, yes. it may be the first, the way I positioned it, it may be the call to action, but I try to understand why I don't automatically assume that what I create is valuable. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes 100% sense. And, and what I love about that, again, is, is really being honest with yourself, right? Exactly. And, and, and not, you know, which we tend to do, I think, normally is we, we have these thoughts in our minds that, yes, you know, this is going to be a great post, so we put it out and it's mm -hmm. not. Well, it has to be some other reason. But you're saying, no, listen and watch the numbers um, because that is important. Can you share with us maybe some of your most successful posts? Mm -hmm. what, 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 what they were and why you believe they, they were so successful. Okay. So actually two of my most successful posts have happened like in the last six to eight weeks. So I'll share two of them. One of them was the Gen Z post where we hired somebody Gen Z. So that did like over like 15 million uh, views and it got like 250,000 likes, blah, blah, blah. But the, I didn't even expect that post to do that well, but looking back, there's two reasons why it did. Number one, it appealed to every Gen Z person on LinkedIn that is graduating or, or just graduated and they're trying to get even an entry level job and they need experience to do that. And then on the flip side, which I didn't even realize when I was writing the post, was that it appealed to everyone, the older population who had been given a chance when they were young. And I realized that because when people were sharing it and they were older, they would think they would be like, thank you. So-and-so for giving me that one chance. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. So Sinead, can you walk us through, you know, and you don't have to spend too much time, but I, I think it's important. Like, can you, when you, before you wrote that, what, mm -hmm. tell us like, what, what were you thinking? Like, what was your idea that day or the day before when you said, I want to write this post? Can you give us a well, little I mean, we did hire a Gen Z person. So I was like, how can I, like this needs to be a post because this person did not have experience. So like by all logical, you know, premise, I shouldn't have hired them, but we did because we took a chance, right? I mean, and, and hiring no matter what is taking a chance. So I was like, how can I provide value to my network and everybody else that, you know, was in the same position as this, as this young girl and kind of teach them why I hired her. So I just, I do it through stories and that's mainly how my posts differentiate is that I don't really inform, I, I tell stories um, and then people take that lesson. And, and I tell people this all the time, the few people that do ask me that are close to me, like how can I improve my posts? I, my main, piece of advice is stop informing your audience about your product or about what you do because they don't really care. Um, they don't know that they care. You know what I mean? Right. And start, 
start telling stories that they could gain value from because at the end of the day we're programmed to remember stories mm. so people remember that people will remember that story for months but if i did a post like these are the top 10 tips for interview uh they're gonna forget it right right you know what i mean wow that's that's really good and that's that's excellent if anything comes out of this episode today for for people that are listening and watching it's that it's tell stories through your post mm -hmm. I mean, that's huge. Well, thank you for providing that. And what about the second one? So the second one is actually interesting because it was about a friend of mine who was mistreated at work. His boss yelled at him. So I, I positioned the story around that. And, you know, after his boss yelled at him, he kind of just texted me like, hey, can you help me find another job? Like, I'm, I want to leave this place. And so that did very well on LinkedIn. I think it got like 150,000 likes and I don't even know the views, but somebody on LinkedIn who I don't even know screenshot it and shared it on Facebook. And on Facebook, it got 150,000 shares. Unbelievable. Like people, I was on LinkedIn and I kept getting these, these uh, messages like, hey, I saw your post on Facebook. I'm like, Facebook? I don't even post on Facebook. And after like 20 of the same type of messages came through, I was like, wait a second, can you, I asked one of them, I was like, can you send me the link? And the girl, whoever it was, screenshot it and they could see my name. So then a lot of them were coming back to LinkedIn or trying to follow me on Instagram. And I've never seen a post on Facebook even like, I mean, people were texting me like somebody from my hometown just shared your post. And it was crazy. Wow. And isn't that wonderful, the, the, the reach, the, the, the impact that we could have today by sharing these stories and the two that you just mentioned are great examples. Mm -hmm. um, it's, just, it's just incredible. And speaking of Facebook, I'm glad you mentioned that. Number one, I, I, I'd like to ask you, what, mm -hmm. why don't you post on Facebook? Is there a particular reason? Is um, there's post? not. Okay. So one thing that I kind of did the math. So let's say 150,000 shares on Facebook, right? Um, so that got around, so for that post to be shared 150,000 times, it was like 20,000 likes. And for LinkedIn, 150,000 likes is around 20,000 shares. It's just the visibility is like at least 10x. So like 100,000 views on Facebook is like organic on LinkedIn, maybe a million. If I, you know, I have to get the exact numbers from that girl. But number one, I don't really understand Facebook like that. Number two, I've heard a lot of people are like in Facebook jail for some reason. I have no idea even what that is. And um, number three, I kind of just follow where the results are right now. And that's LinkedIn. And now, I mean, now Facebook is growing because of that one girl that shared the post. So Unreal. it's interesting. No, no, again, I'm glad you said that. I. I had built a decent following on Facebook. I believe it's about 25,000 followers. Wow, that's great. But about nine months ago, 10 months ago, everything changed. Mm -hmm. And people started to ask me, why aren't I seeing your posts? And things just changed. So that's- Yeah, I think it's like, didn't they change the rule that only like 20% or something of your network could see your post or something? Yes. So it became very discouraging, you know, quite yeah. frankly. And, and I've been putting my energy into LinkedIn um, as well and, and seeing a tremendous uptick. So I feel, and I, I'm sure you do as well, based on everything I already said, that we are just at the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. or what's to happen on LinkedIn. Because people are every day just kind of catching on. Mm -hmm. and, and I heard a stat of like less than 1% of people even post on, on LinkedIn. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, it's going to be incredible, like, the next three years. Um, but, you know, it's just catching, like I said, it's all about timing. So right now, LinkedIn is at an incredible reach for organic content. I mean, whoever's not taking advantage of that is, I, to get a million views on Facebook, I think you would have to pay, like, over 10 grand. You know what I mean? Um, like, paid ads. So, and that's pretty easy to design on LinkedIn with organic reach. So you can't even compare the two. And it's just about compounding and building that momentum and growing your network before, you know, more and more people sign up and it gets more saturated, like something like Instagram, Instagram to become 
um, a thought leader on right now is nearly impossible because it's already saturated. Yeah. On LinkedIn, somebody who started from nothing like me could really do so in 12 months with the right guidance. And it's still possible. I don't know if it will be possible three years from now or as easy. You know what I mean? It's always possible, but it's not going to be as easy three years from now when a lot more people are creating content and a lot more people are on the platform. And, uh, you know, so I'm just taking advantage of the wave. Absolutely. I love how you position that as well. So we talked a little bit about video. You, you talked, uh, gave us some examples of your early ones. Mm -hmm. Anything else about video that people should know or that you'd like to discuss um, why it is so effective? Yeah, so video has actually produced the most uh, revenue for us in terms of like inbound interest and stuff because people read content, it's wonderful, but they really need to put a face to the author. So I like to at least publish a video once every other day, um, you know, so that people are able to, you know, they hear your voice, they see how you speak, your mannerisms, and that just builds a, a, the next level of trust, especially if you know what to say in your videos or, you know, base it on real life experience where they could take something valuable from it. I don't recommend that you're always selling something in the video or that's a whole other topic, but video for me is essential and it doesn't have to be perfect. A lot of people make the excuse that they need the best lighting, the best camera, and you don't. You just need to really just start and evolve from there. And two questions off of that. Do you, do you tend to tell stories as well through the video? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes my videos are just like quick information or... Other times, if it's like about a minute or a minute and a half long, I will, you know, be like, hey, this just happened and this is what I'm taking away from the, this experience and something that you can take away too. That's how I really, but I don't waste people's time. Like, you know, that's the main thing. A lot of people don't get good video engagement because they don't catch the person's interest and they have to understand that people are investing their time in your content. So you have to make it worthwhile. Absolutely. And you already answered my second question was about how long do you try to make the videos? And you said like well, a minute, minute. Okay. if I can, like 45 seconds, but like I try to cut it off at, at a minute. Mm, great, great. Yeah. And I think in life in general, and I was, uh, I might've put a post up about this yesterday or was talking to someone about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. To me, every interaction that we have with people, like right now, I'm really, really present with you, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I wasn't always like this. Like I, I'm trying not to think about anything else other than our interview right, and right. your words, right? But it's hard to do. So every interaction that I try to make, including posts, mm -hmm. video, is, mm -hmm. you know, I, I try to put everything I have into it. And, and it sounds, again, I, I, I'm probably asking you, you know, throwing you like a softball question, but I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Like, are you there as well? Like, it has to be really thoughtful before mm -hmm. you throw something out there. Yeah, for me, I just pay attention to what's happening in my life and my surroundings. So I did a post last night um, about a friend who quit her job yesterday. And that, that post was just about an hour after she had called me and Courtney on three-way and explained, you know, she was on her drive home and she explained that she quit her job. And I was just like, why did you quit your job? And she told us how she felt. And I felt like my network could learn something from that. and. You know, a lot of people are like, where should I create content? And it's just like, pay attention to what's happening in your surroundings. That's all you have to do. You don't have to call people out by name. You just have to say somebody I know or a friend is going through this. And a lot of people could learn from other people's experience so that they don't make the same mistake. And they like to um, join a community where they could relate, you know, uh, which is powerful. Relatability in your posts is extremely powerful. And that's where the value really comes from. People are going to invest time in your posts if they can relate to it. And that will determine if it's valuable or not. Like I said, there's so many people that are like, my posts are so valuable, but they're not getting any engagement for over a year. You know, so how, how can you say that? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I interviewed a gentleman, Todd Collins, and 
he said something that was pretty impactful. He said, you know, would you, would you watch you? You know, if right. you were on the other side, would you be engaged? And, and if you step back and say, I don't know, then maybe rethink it. So it sounds like you're saying the same thing as well. Yeah. And it's all, it's all about building, you know, people get into content creation for very selfish reasons. They want business, which is great. They want to grow a network and they want to be a quote unquote influencer and whatever. But if that comes across in your content, people are not going to join your community. You know, you, it's all about giving and, um, you know, 95% giving 5% maybe taking, I mean, I've been, I've been releasing content for a year and a half. I haven't sold anybody anything. You know, I've been released a book, come buy this, come buy whatever. Um, and they trust me because of that. If you're constantly pushing products and, you know, programs down your community's throat or so many people reach out to me to try to pay me to shout them out in videos. And I deny all influencer marketing because if I start getting bought by all these products and stuff, the trust of my network is going to go down and it's, it's worth much more than a few thousand dollars here and there, you know? Wow. And that's another, that's another thing that once people do have that network, they destroy the trust because they're kind of bought out by like five products. Right. Totally not worth it. I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. I'm definitely not there, but I'm with you at heart because um, if you, if you understand that from the beginning, you know, before you grow your network and you stick to it, I feel that's, that's how to advance. Um, mm -hmm. I, I never heard that stat 95, five. So yeah. I love that. You know, I've heard maybe 85, 15 or yeah. 70, 30, but that's, that's powerful. Yeah. And, and honestly, like people are just like, so into, you know, strategy, let's say, okay, healthcare, right? So, so into contacting the healthcare decision makers, but I mean, they'll, if you're putting out the right type of content, it's all about visibility. And here, I'll break, I'll break something down. A lot of the content that I, I put out has nothing to do with what I do. A lot of people don't even know what I do, that I'm in health healthcare marketing or whatever. But if my content, let's say, gets to the point, I mean, just so you understand between January and today, just on LinkedIn, I've generated 60 million views. But let's say I'm starting at the beginning. If I get 1 million people to see my content every month, that's gonna, 1% of those people are gonna visit my profile. I mean, we're just talking numbers. Again, people like don't look at numbers. Of the 1% of people that look at my profile, 1% of those are gonna be interested. They're gonna reach out, they're gonna message me, they're gonna tell a friend about me, whatever. And then of the 1% of the people that reach out, or maybe 10% of the people that reach out, I'll do business with in the next six months. So people are so focused on targeting their specific industry, their specific audience, but what they don't realize is without that visibility, you know, you're, you're restricting your funnel so much that it's, it doesn't even make any sense. Wow, and that, I mean, again, I've never heard those stats, but it really puts things into perspective, right? And it, mm -hmm. it just kind of wakes you up, like, well, come on. Let's do the right thing, which is don't be so narrow minded and, mm -hmm. and, and let's really look at the numbers. If that, that's amazing. You know, that's amazing that such a small percentage would look at the profile and then actually take an action. I mean, I'm, and, and, and the percentage is usually much higher, but I'm going like the worst case scenario, like sure. with an optimized profile, you know, for what you do. So, um, let me just, uh, so if 10,000 people looked at your profile a month, um, that would be like 100. Let's say 1% of that reached out. And then 1% of, you know, I do, let's say 10 of those reached out. So that, that'd be like 5 to 10 deals a month. So what does that mean to you? That, that's a huge number. Yep. Just with like a million views of, of visibility. That could change somebody's business or allow them to go all in. So 100%. So, and, that, and that's inbound, you know? Right. And that, that was my next question, actually. I was going to say, help us understand your outbound. Like, where, where are you interested at this level? Where do you, if you want to go into it, of course, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. anything proprietary. But I'm just curious, like, are you strategizing on who you want to connect with? 
Yeah, I mean, he, I usually do not do a lot of outbound. Like, I mean, and that's my bad because we need to improve our automation, you know? Um, but I do have like, let's, let's say I want to uh, speak to somebody or, you know, talk to them about our services. I never just personal message them. It's for me, it's long-term game. So I'll engage with their content for a couple of weeks, um, liking their posts, commenting on their posts. And then I may message them like regarding a post. Um, I may connect them with somebody that they want to be connected to. And then I may be like, Hey, um, I'd love to speak to you or, or meet with you in person and just, you know, talk more about your business, whatever. For me, it's not just like personal messaging somebody like, let me sell you healthcare marketing. That's, that's not it. The relationship is much more valuable to me than the transaction. So. Fantastic. Uh, speaking of healthcare marketing, you've mentioned it a few times now. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an overview of, uh, you know, the, we know about your early days and mm -hmm. all the hard work you put in. So just so our viewers and listeners understand, and maybe there's people out there that, that are from your space that, mm -hmm. that want to learn more, what should they know? So they should know that it's extremely important. So, and, and people are kind of getting on the wave, especially hospitals. They're late to adopt some, you know, social media and they're, you know, just they're later on the technology wave than most industries. But a lot of them don't understand they are eating up smaller private practices. So a lot of them don't understand how to still come across as being relatable and connected to the community while being like a huge healthcare system. And we help them do that. So one way that we help them do that is position uh, certain physicians, depending on the institution, as you know, thought leaders in whatever specialty that they practice in. And you know, another way is video production, but what they have to understand is that years ago, you could pay like $25,000 for one video, you could use a video all year to promote your healthcare facility, kind of works. Now, after you post that video once, it's dead it's over, which is why you need content and you need new video and why also the cost of entry is much lower. Like there are teenagers with agencies that they just use iPhones and some little gadgets and they can make very professional quality video. Um, so they just need to understand what they're getting. And Unfortunately, because they're so busy, what happens is a lot of the time they do contract an agency and they, they pay them a lot of money and they're not really delivering or the agency doesn't communicate or at the end of the quarter, the agency sends them like a report on impressions or whatever and they don't even understand. You know what I mean? And that happens all the time. And it, and it sounds like really that whether it's healthcare or any industry, I mean, this is valid across the board, right? Mm -hmm. So it, 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 if, if you're sitting here and you're in the insurance business, it's no different uh, right. than, than, than healthcare, right? You, mm -hmm. you have to keep up with the times. We have to keep moving. Otherwise, we're going to end up like Blockbuster, you mm -hmm. know, or those companies that didn't reinvent. And, and a big part of that is through our marketing and through our um, you know, social media and our videos. So, wow, mm -hmm. that's, that's really insightful. Um, I, I like how you talked about the prices come down and I like how you talked about, yeah. you know, quantity. We have to, you know, you, you put out one video, you have to move on to the next. It's just like what you do every other day, you put out a, a new video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, they just, they just have to understand it's, it's necessary for them to connect with their community. And this is where the community is spending their time and where they're going to be reading information. So it's not a coincidence that like the most successful and highest rated hospital uh, hospitals and healthcare systems are the ones investing in, you know, social media and marketing and, and just keeping up with the times. So. Fantastic. And we'll, you know, we'll post in the show notes how to reach you if someone is interested. Oh yeah, 100%. Those services. Awesome. 
Um, you mentioned earlier when you were talking about maybe connecting with people online mm -hmm. and then possibly having an in-person meeting. Mm -hmm. How important, I'm sorry, how important is networking and in, in-person meetings? I think it's like the most important thing. Um, you know, getting to know somebody online is great, but people can really become your lifetime ambassador if you connect with them in person and they just feel like you're real. Like I've met so many people at networking events the past year that uh, refer me uh, clients or refer, you, you know, refer me to connect with other people that have referred me clients just because the way they felt when we met in person. Um, it could be last month, it could be six months ago, but one thing is, you know, coming across authentic in video, but if you really match that in person, like people, people think it's priceless and they, they really want to build a friendship with you and, you know, you can't put a value on that. So I get the chills. Necessary. Yeah. I get the chills as you're talking because, uh, and, and you said it's all about timing with everything, but just mm -hmm. yesterday I was interacting with someone and, and a quote came to my mind and I've heard it many times. I'm sure you have too. It's, it's not what you say that people remember, but how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you could get, if, if, if there's no other, um, you know, mission when you meet someone other than being authentic, I think that's the, the most crucial thing. And, and again, I work really hard at this cause I wasn't always this way. I was more selfish, you know, when I was younger and, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about, okay, I have to put food on the table for my family. Right. I, as soon as I was able to make that shift and be more myself mm -hmm. in person, it's, it's changed everything. Yeah. And the best compliment for me is like when people do, you know, like, let's say they meet you, they say, Oh my gosh, you're just like, the, you're exactly how I imagined you to be. You know what I mean? Like, yes, exactly like you are in your videos. I mean, there is no front or whatever. So, uh, and like you said, I mean, at the end of the day, we're, you know, everyone's in business. They have to provide for their family and stuff, but, when you really help others do the same, you know, like that quote, like the more you help people get what they want, the more you can get what you want. Uh, and I really, really believe that. So I think in-person networking, and for me, it was not easy. This is like something weird that people assume. People assume I'm like the biggest extrovert, the most social person there is, I guess because of my network or just uh, being comfortable in video, but I'm, I'm actually pretty quiet and uh, like I would consider myself more of an, an introvert because, you know, copywriting and just the creative side. Uh, so sometimes when people meet me, uh, I could be quiet to them, you know? Um, and it's funny because Courtney, who my co-founder, who's less comfortable in video is like the most extrovert and social <laughs> person when you meet her in person. So it's kind of funny how that happens. It is. No, and I could totally relate because I'm a writer and I, you know, I, you know, when we do these types of things, our personalities come out and right. in their videos. But yeah, I mean, many of us behind the scenes are, are introverts and I think that's a good, actually a good thing. And, and it, yeah, 100%. you get out of your comfort zone, whatever way you are in life. So, yeah. And then that's where I meant to go with that is that like when I started going to networking events, like I was kind of shy at first and you feel a little bit uncomfortable, but it's worth it. Like what I've learned is just every person you meet is worth knowing, worth having in your phone. You never know how you could help them and how, and how they could help you. And I think that one goal for all of us should be like if internet were to disappear today or like all these social media platforms, like your phone book should be able to carry you through the next 10 years, you know, or the rest of your life. Um, just the connections that you build. But I mean, a phone book means nothing if you don't invest in nurturing those relationships. So that's what I always think about. I love that. I really love that. Um, if s someone's not doing networking today, if they're only on social media, what advice? I mean, do they attend chamber luncheons? What, 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 where should they go? Um, try to go to, uh, I mean, uh, try to ask your friends if they know of a networking event. I know Facebook, you know, maybe has some, like look on your social, whatever platforms in your city. Eventbrite probably has a ton. Just 
get out there even if it's not even if it's like kind of like not in your industry attend ones that are not in your industry attend as many as possible because that's how you meet people who will know where more of them are and you know you'll never regret it that's for sure excellent shanae um collaborations are something or partnerships happening mm -hmm. all the time in our world we see it in the music industry you know with two 100%. two wonderful singers are collaborating and those things didn't happen 20 30 years ago right mm -hmm. uh, but it's also happening in our in our business world and, and on linkedin and other social platforms what are your thoughts on collabs and and you know have you done any do you have any success oh, yeah. this year? Uh, I think that one of the main reasons for my growth has been collaboration and like the, just a spirit of collaboration, especially, you know, um, you know, in the earlier time of me being on LinkedIn, I tried to provide value to people that had larger networks than me and then I'll collaborate. And, you know, obviously what people have to realize is that when you collaborate with somebody, their network is getting exposed to that person, uh, to you, and your network is getting exposed to that person. So it's literally a win-win. And people like, let's say, famous rappers like Drake. Drake is like a master at collaboration because even when he's not creating content, he's being featured on everybody's content, and he does it strategically. He also, um, you know, his team, I would say, also is aware of who is up and coming in his space that he could kind of help lift up and build that relationship with. So that's another way that he's old reason he's always collaborating. I mean, I would say like in the music space, he's the master of collaboration and that just shows with his success over the past, like what, five to eight years. Um, he's, you know, there's collaboration will really help whoever you are, uh, move from just being maybe like an in, an influencer thought leader in your industry to really becoming the ultimate goal iconic which is people know you outside of your industry as well um and without collaborating with other people you know you're gonna burn out and your network is gonna get capped you know you have to like drip into other people's networks and the best way to do that is collaborating with them wow so well said and uh, and i the fact that you brought up, and I didn't think about this, right? It's important to mentor. It's important to watch mm -hmm. conversations. Oh, 100%. Them, reach out to them, be of mm -hmm. service to them as well, because you never know where, where that will lead. Not to mention, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. So many people are just like, oh, I know I don't have a huge network, but like, could I do a LinkedIn Live? And really, when I got LinkedIn Live, it was like, everyone was kind of hoarding LinkedIn Live to themselves, like, oh, it's exclusive and all that. And the first thing I did was start sharing my live with everybody. And like, I was like, come on, like, let's do all these interviews. People that had got denied, I would just put them on. Um, you know, I, 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 to this day, I've never done a LinkedIn live alone. So, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, we covered a lot of ground today. Yeah, we did. So, uh, we did. so appreciative. Well, one <laughs> last uh, topic that I had uh, was your speaking. I know that's really important to you. Can you talk a little bit about your platform, what your intentions are, and where you see your, your speaking going in the future? So it's kind of happened by demand. Like most things, you know, people like to shoot for everything at once, but if they really just focus on one thing and become effective at that, like next level things will just happen by demand. So I've been invited to speak at healthcare conferences and many, you know, LinkedIn locals and stuff in the past six months and, and now more and more companies um, in the healthcare space and just women's leadership and stuff have asked me, you know, to share my story and Courtney as well. So where I really just feel like my speaking will go is I just want to reach as many people as possible and inspire them. For me, that's the only thing that matters is, you know, helping healthcare systems become more effective and helping uh you know young people or women or whoever it doesn't matter uh overcome adversity or help them overcome adversity and then really uh give it their all in whatever they want to do so i mean it, it's something i'm very passionate about and looking forward to because a lot of just more and more people keep reaching out so they're being scheduled and it's interesting 
Wow. It's another adventure. That's the way like I'm looking at it. Absolutely. And again, it's a result of all this hard work on LinkedIn, right? Exactly. So for people listening, that's, that's just an after effect of, of all of this, um, yes. this year and a half of, of um, consistency. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. You know, we, covered and, a lot. <laughs> we, we, we covered a lot of ground. I would like to ask you, I ask every guest, and, and I hope someday we could do an in-person interview. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a little bit more personal. But um, at the end of the day, and I know you're, you're young, um, but what, what do you want your legacy to be? What kind of mark are you trying to leave here on, on this earth? I would say that I want people to know that you know they don't need to they don't need to be extremely talented to become successful they don't need to be born into the right family environments um they could make mistakes even into their adulthood but as long as they're committed to number one letting go of whatever they need to to succeed and then number two adopting you know new habits uh that it's possible and that you know, my thing is, is just helping people. I, I want to help people transform um, their professional kind of life and just be better at uh, be better at living the life that makes them happy, you know? And I know that's really general, but that's the type of legacy I would like to leave. And it's just for me, it's just the beginning. Like, it's just like, I feel like this is just like the 1% into like my journey as well. So I'm discovering my, uh, the legacy I'd like to leave along the way, I guess. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I'm honored that we are connected at this Me moment too. for you. And I can't wait to watch and support you in all of your efforts. Uh, welcome to the American Real family, Shanae. Thanks. And we will, be in touch really soon. Yeah. Thank you so much, Roger. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv, or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle or want one-on-one -on -one coaching, Check out the American Real Learning Academy, where we have self-help groups and courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast, contact me today to see if we could help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week.